While you remain standing, I'll read the scripture for today. It's only one verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. It is such a small verse. Can we read this together? Okay? Let's do this together. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. You know, around the world, Los Angeles is known as the city of dreams. And every young person, not just in America, all over the world, dream about coming to Los Angeles. Because it's a tinsel town, right? The city of glitz and glamour. And this is where people live the dream. Live the dream, right? Don't we want to live the dream? Isn't that we all want to do? I'm living my dream. Now, in the Bible, there's this man, we all know him from Sunday school classes. His name is Joseph. He is a man who lived the dream. He is actually called a dreamer. That was his name. That was his nickname, dreamer. And he had this spectacular dream of, you know, a couple of them, but one of the ones which takes the cake is the one in which the sun and the moon and the stars bow down before him. Now, that's quite a dream to live, right? Yeah. Then he started living the dream. Age 17, his brothers wound him up and put him in a ditch, in a pit. Then a caravan of slave owners rescued him and paraded him like a circus animal from city to city, sold him from houses to houses. And then, eventually, he thought he got a break. He got a nice master named Potiphar, and he was kind of in charge of administration and governance. Then he was accused of the worst possible crime, the Me Too crime of that century. This was a little different, though. He was falsely accused of sexual assault and thrown into a prison. And there he ended up with, the, with all kinds of criminals, the robbers and the thieves, and, and he was eventually asked to manage a death row in prison. People who were condemned to death, he was in charge of, of those people. And then he actually helped the person to get out of the death row and go back to uh, the king's uh, place in a palace and asking him to remember him, that person completely abandoned him, betrayed him, denied him in a way. Now, that is what he called living the dream. <laughs> was Joseph living the dream? Yes, he was. But here is the twist. He was not living his dream, but he was living the dream of God. He was called to live God's dream. Now, that's a problem, right? We often go to God in our prayer with all of our dream, and God, I have this dream, and please help me accomplish this. Our prayers are almost always like that. God, I have this dream. Can you give this dream to me? And we rarely, if not never, ask God, God, by the way, what is your dream for me? What is your dream for me? I'd like to know that. No. <laughs> so now, but the end, when you live God's dream, your life becomes a series of unfortunate events, at least seemingly. And that's what happened to Joseph, right? It's a series of unfortunate events. The guy cannot even catch a break. But then, in the end, comes the climactic twist. 
And the dreamer was called to the emperor's office, the palace, the court, to interpret the dream of the king. Now that changed everything. Suddenly, this man, Joseph, finds himself as the second in command in Egypt. Now he is a Hebrew man. He is a Hebrew slave at that time. Suddenly, he became the second in command. Actually, Pharaoh says that I will only take the title, but you can do whatever you want in the kingdom. That kind of position, suddenly Pharaoh attributes it to him. And now Joseph looked back and realized this. While he was going through from this pit to prison and to Potiphar, all these things, he was, being, he was developing certain kind of skills. And in the pit, he knew how to survive, the survival skill. And Potiphar's house, he learned administration. It is not like, you know, Pharaoh just invited him. Oh, you interpret my dream, so I'm going to make you second in command. Nobody will do that. Joe Biden will not call me and say, Matthew, he interpreted my dream, so, you know, come and be my vice president. No. No, he cannot. First of all, I'm not even an American. And this guy is not an Egyptian, right? He is not Egyptian. He, is, he, he's, he has no, it's not because he interpreted the dream. Pharaoh looked at him. Interpreting the dream was just a, just a step, you know, just a, he, he got the foot in the door. But Pharaoh looked at him, and this man has already acquired the skills that needed to administrate the kingdom. That happened in the pit, and that happened in Potiphar's home, and that happened in the prison. So all along, suddenly, Joseph realized that, oh, I thought I was going through a series of unfortunate events, but all along, God was developing the skills in me to live his dream. His dream. Now, <laughs> and Genesis chapter 50, 20, Joseph kind of reminisces all these events, and he says something like this. As for you, you meant evil against me. This is, he's talking to his brothers, right? You meant evil against me, but God, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. Now, this is exactly what Paul is paraphrasing in Romans chapter 8, 28. All these things, all the series of unfortunate events work together for something good. Now, Paul had his own unfortunate events too. And Paul gives in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 24 to 28. Listen to this. This is what this is how Paul lived the dream. Not his dream, God's dream. Okay, this is how he lived the dream. Paul accounts this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spend in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern of all the churches. Now that is living the dream. <laughs> that is living the dream. All these apparently bad things, Paul knows that this is working together for something really, really good in the end because I am not living my dream. I am living the dream of God. Now that comes with a qualifier though, right? All things don't always work together for good. The qualifier is for those who love him and for those who are called 
according to his purpose. Now, the word calling, we have over-spiritualized that, that term, right? Very often when we say calling, it's about being a pastor or being in ministry and going to Africa, leave everything, and I'm called by God to do something. No, calling is essentially, in, in its simplest sense, means living God's dream. What is God's dream for each of us? That varies differently. It's just like you have different dreams for your children. God has different dreams for all of us. So it is not exactly standing on the pulpit and talking about it, but in different ways we can live as we go out from the church and we can realize and we can identify what is our calling according to God's purpose and live that way, then all these things, apparently bad things that is working in our life, will be turned into something really good and something really beautiful because it is the same God who turned the worst possible things in human history to make it uh, the best possible thing that ever happened to humanity. It is the same God who has called you according to his purpose. Now, the second part of the sermon to preach, and I have some help. <laughs> I thought, you know, if I preach about calling, you will still misunderstand it's about, you know, I'm inviting you to volunteer or I'm inviting you to do some, some churchy stuff. But I want to introduce you to two of my friends who are going to preach the second part of the sermon, okay? First person, you don't need any introduction. Lauren White, would you come on and Lauren, you know, <laughs> come on. Now, uh, I saw Lauren the very first time I stepped into this church, and she has always been on the stage as a worship leader, and you all, almost always, yeah, that Lauren. But I, you know, now she, you know, I gave her a maternity leave. <laughs> they already have, um, now this is the third, you know, we have Annabelle, Theo, and Trey. Yeah, Trey. So, you know, she's coming back after her maternity. Um, but... Later I realized that she's not just Lauren, she's Dr. Lauren White, not, a, not exactly a fake doctor, not like a real doctor. This is a conversation before, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren, and this is a conversation we had last week. We are continuing on that. But, uh, you know, she is actively involved in that. She works for JPL. She's a scientist there, and she is actively, she was actively involved in that Mars Rover project, and, uh, and when they created their promo video, actually Lauren's face was there. Lauren was part of that video, and she quite often tells me, Pastor Matthew, we did uh, we did a hole, we dug a hole in Mars, right? Like, you know, that's what they Sampled do. Sampled. Sample, okay. They take samples in Mars. That's what she does for a living, and, you know. See, they, they, they basically dug holes in Mars sitting from here. And that's something I used to do when I was three years old, yeah. digging a hole in Earth. Another planet. It's all planets. It's really funny to do that now. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That's how our tax dollars go, right? Yeah, anyway. Yeah, you so, pay me, thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> the, the next person I want to introduce, there are so many ways to introduce him because if you Google him, you know, it, it's a mouthful, you know. So, so I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, my first meeting with him. So there was a time in my life when I was an itinerary speaker. I was going from church to church and speaking in different churches. And I met this gentleman who was the uh, chair of the board at the time. He introduced me. His name is, he said his name is Larry. And, and he was the one who introduced me to speak. And then I spoke and he really liked me. And then they invited me again. I used to, I used to speak there very often. And Larry always thought, said to, uh, used to tell me that Matthew, you're very funny. You have, a, you have a great sense of humor. And Larry has a great sense of humor too. So we kind of joke about stuff. And sometimes I say, you know what, Larry, this pastor thing doesn't work out. I want to go and do stand-up comedy in Hollywood. And then Larry, <laughs> Larry would say, yeah, you do it. I'll open for you. Yeah, Larry, you open. I'll... Anyway, so we, this is the kind of conversations we have, right? And one day Larry said, hey, do you want to come to my office and I'll buy you lunch? I sure, you know. So I went to, you know, where do you work? And Larry said, I work for JPL. Oh, everybody in Pasadena work for JPL. It's not a big deal. So, you know, <laughs> So, so I go, I go, this is my first time to go to, I needed a reason to go to JPL, so I go to JPL one day, and I drive in, 
Uh, and you know, there's this guest parking lot, it's just crowded, and I'm like, oh my. So how do I find parking? I drive in, then the security, security guard flags me, oh, sir, you don't park there, you park there. That's the president's lot. That's, it's, I think that's called president's lot, or something like that. It's a very VIP parking lot. I'm like, really? I can park there? Yeah, yeah, that's where you go, you're going to park. So I go there, you know, like a, I don't know, it's just like a big uh, two basketball court size right in by the step. There is a BMW and a Lexus or something parked. I just tuck my Ford Focus right in the middle so that nobody will see. <laughs> and, and I... That's right. I, I don't get to park there. Yeah, you don't get to park there. Yeah, I got to. That first, that's my first visit to JPL, right? Anyway, I get out, and there is this wonderful lady there waiting for me. Are you Matthew Jones? Yes, I'm here to escort you. Oh, my goodness. So I'm escorted all the way to the top floor. To cut a long story short, I walk in. I'm, I'm meeting my friend, Larry, who's going to open my comedy show, right? And I walk in. That's what I know about Larry. And, and, I, and I opened. She, she invites me to his office. Larry's office is literally bigger than the apartment we used to live in that time. And that's when I realized that Larry James, General Larry James, is a three-star general from Pentagon. And he is the man who runs the show. He was the deputy director of JPL at the time. He is interim director. He's going back to his position because he, he's a man of action. So he is the man who controlled the whole show. And, and I, I went there. I literally shook. My goodness, this is the Larry. I was talking so casually. So, so that's, that's Larry for you. Larry James, I'm so proud that people like that are Christians and unambashedly, unashamedly, you know, Christians and their witness and they live out their calling on a daily basis. So it's my privilege to present to you General Larry James. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Thank you. So this is what I'm going to do. There's too much, too much IQ here. <laughs> I feel a little inferior, you know. I, I, so I would really like you to have a conversation about what we were talking about, particularly in relation to how you live out your calling in an in a extremely secular environment, if I can call that. And by the way, the reason I, I read that verse, that is Larry's life verse. Larry wanted me to read that verse, Romans 8.28. So take it from here, Lauren. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm actually going to diverge a little bit from the script that Matthew gave me because I felt like there was one first question I had to ask General James, um, which... Larry. <sighs> it's hard because he's my boss, so I'm... <laughs> I'm on my best behavior today. Please let me keep my job. Um, <laughs> so I think you all know what I'm probably going to ask him because, you know, he picked that verse. Um, but I have to ask it for the sake of the audience, Larry. Um, do aliens really exist? <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Well, just kidding. We're not going to answer that. If you look around, perhaps one of your neighbors. That's I true. Know, you know. I'm pretty sure one of my cousins. Okay, so really, we already know the answer to that, but we would have to kill you if we told you. Um, so, uh, really, what we want to talk about is Romans 8:28. So the first question is, why did you pick that verse? Pastor Matthew said, pick your favorite. What brought you to that verse, and why? Why did you pick that one? Yeah, I think, um, I think Matthew really gave a great introduction to kind of why, right? Now, how many of you want to be thrown in a pit? Raise your hand. You know, not many of us. And yet, I think that verse spoke to me. I was very blessed. I grew up in a, a Christian home. I uh, had wonderful Christian teachers in church and Sunday school and those sorts of things. And, and yet, there's also struggles in life. And so, for me, that verse just spoke to say that you know, if you're indeed loving Christ and loving God, and if you feel that you are called to follow him, things are going to work out. And, you know, Matthew talked about Joseph, and, and you know, it may take a while for things to work out. Um, but just having that 
comfort, having that security, knowing that no matter what path I'm going down, no matter what is happening around me, um, God is going to be in control and God is going to bring these things to a good end. Now, you know, a good end on, in this life may not be, you know, it may be hard. You know, um, I love J.I. Packer uh, and I love C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, you know, God whispers to us in our comfort. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pain. And I think that we all go through pain. Uh, we all walk a hard road. And I think this really came home to me when my sister, who was in her mid-20s, had graduated dental school, was opening a dental practice, recently married, and then had leukemia. And so that was a long journey, many trips to MD Anderson for the family, giving platelets and those sorts of things. But ultimately, the Lord took her home. And you think, well, what's the good, Lord? What's the good? And yet she was a bright light for Christ, just like the song that we sang at the end there, this gentleman who was in the hospital and who was a bright light for Christ. And he would say, I think, to all of us, uh, and I think my sister would too, that all things are working together for good. But, you know, it's tough on us who see that. And it's tough on us when we go through those things. So I think that just reinforced that that's why that's my life first, because there's ups, there's downs, there's pits, there's mountaintops, and yet it all works together for good if we love Christ and if we are following the calling that he's given us. Yeah. Is that a long answer or a That's short answer? That's a great answer. <laughs> so it's, it's actually really fascinating for me because I don't get to hear the, the personal stories from, I can't call you Larry, I just want to call you General James. I just send from your Larry. memos that say go do this and go do that. You know? um, <laughs> And I think it's hard for all of us. I, I, would, I would share that same, um, how do you say it's good? Um, because when you're going through it, it's really difficult. And so uh, maybe give some examples, maybe through that leukemia, or maybe also during your career. I mean, you worked at the Pentagon in intelligence. There was some crazy stuff going on there. I don't even know. I look at your resume, and I, don't, I, I have to think there were some stressful times there, right? And you went through the military, and we all know military is really stressful. And we all know MIT is really stressful. Um, so, you know, maybe if you could give us some examples too, just like in your journey as you rose to these really second in command type positions like Joseph had, moments where you thought, oh, how could this be good? <laughs> and then you saw God turn it around, but it took time. Um, I think, you know, going back to my Air Force days, um, uh, we were getting ready to do Operation Iraqi Freedom, and I was told I was going to deploy to the desert for that. However, my daughter was also going to be getting married in that time frame. And when we were told we were going to deploy, um, they said, we don't know how long you're going to be gone. And, and, of course, my wife Susan is here, and she wasn't necessarily happy about that. <laughs> Are you going to be back for your daughter's wedding? Uh, but again, you know, you go forth, you're called in a way to do this. I felt like this was part of my calling, you know, to serve and do those sorts of things. And, and so you're there in the desert, you're executing the operations, doing all the things that we had to do. But I still remember that, you know, when we were there, it was Easter. We celebrated Easter. And there was just this small group of us that got together in the middle of the desert in this small room near the command center and celebrated Easter. And that was just to me such a powerful thing for those men and women that were there to, to realize we're all away from our families, we're all doing a hard thing, we don't know when we're going home, and yet God was in the midst of that. And so for God to just walk beside us and we had that comfort of saying, I am working this together for good. And, and the good news is that I made it home for my daughter's wedding. We're still married 43 years later. So, <laughs> uh, so that was the good thing. And then, you know, the other thing that has really stuck with me, and it's more recent, and that's really how I came to this job at JPL. 
Uh, and again, just like Joseph and, you know, going down these weird twists and turns and how things happen, but in the end, God is just knitting things together that you have no idea that he's knitting together, right? And so um, I had worked in my military career, I had worked with JPL in some of the classified work that they do. You may not know they do that, but they do. And uh, so I got to know the director and the deputy director pretty well in the course of that. And so they knew me. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later, and this is where the God thing really comes in in my mind, is that I was in the Pentagon in my job uh, and had been told that you're going to then be promoted and go to another job, to Command Space Command. Um, and so, yeah, okay, and that was the message, and that was confirmed several times and so on. And then we get a new head of the Air Force, chief of staff. And so we have this big, you know, kind of uh, uh, reading, some meeting retreat for all the three stars in the Air Force, and he's calling everyone in and saying, here's what you're going to go do next. And I remember this, this was December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, <laughs> when we were doing this. So he calls me and I fully expect, yeah, you're gonna leave here next summer, you're gonna go to Colorado Springs, you're gonna take this job. That was the plan. And then he says, I'd like you to retire. Wow. wow. <laughs> and I just kinda, wait, what did you say? You know? Did you talk to this other general that had told me these things? Yes. So, so anyway, you work your way through that, right? And it, because it was a shock. It was like, wait a minute, I'm gonna put you down in the pit. You know, you're, you're leaving, you're doing these things. So, but the reality is God had such an incredible plan because I am literally in my office in the Pentagon, I don't know, a month and a half later, thinking about, well, now, where do I go from the Air Force? What do I do? And my, my assistant comes in and she says, well, there's a Dr. Elachi on the phone that would like to talk to you, who was the head of JPL. And he said, Larry, I hear you're retiring from the Air Force. Yes, I am. How would you like to come and be my deputy director? And I mean, it's just like, that's God. That is totally God, you know. Um, Because, because the flip side of that is the current deputy director was retiring, and that only happens every eight to ten years, and they, we stay in, in the position a while. So the timing of him retiring and me retiring and the ability to come here and do what my calling is, my passion, um, was totally God. And by the way, I met my wife in Southern California, and now she gets to come back after I moved her 22 times. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I think... Just seeing those things, you see that God is knitting things together through the pain, through the weirdness, through the, us not understanding, and yet at the end, he has a purpose. Yeah, 100%. And I'm going to echo that because standing on the stage with the deputy director of GPL and talking about God weaving our lives together is like unthinkable to me when I started my journey to working for NASA and people telling me that I was going to lose my faith by going down the route of science and engineering. And um, I had people telling me that, oh, you go far enough in engineering and science, you'll give up this God thing. And uh, how encouraging it is for those of us at JPL who are believers to know, I remember the day I found out, wait, Larry James is an elder at a church? No. <laughs> what? And then- I'm, I'm actually a comedy intro act in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But I have to encourage you that it gives people like me hope that we can be a light as well at JPL in our workplace. Uh, maybe it's a little less complicated for us than it is for you in your position some, some days, but for us to be encouraged that there's someone even as far up as deputy director and that you can still be a Christ follower and still maintain these positions. And I, I think about people like Daniel and Joseph in the Bible and those examples, but having a real tangible example next to me is just, it's beyond encouraging. It's a gift from the Lord. So he is weaving it together and I have to thank you for your faith. Um, yeah, we can clap for that. I know we're running out of time. I'm keeping track. So the last thing I want to say is um, we have this Infinity Summit coming up May 21st. And so, um, you know, I believe you're giving a lecture 
at that. And so are you going to be speaking about Romans 8, 28? And, and how do you feel like that kind of plays into this, the purpose of the summit that we're about to have? I'm actually going to reveal the location of the aliens. Oh. So, <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, thanks to Matthew for putting this together. I mean, you know, the whole question, I think the theme is really what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? And it's kind of what does science have to do with religion? And I think that is such an important question for our times as we look at all that's going on around us. And so, Matthew, thank you for really putting together an incredible group of people who will come and really dig into that. But I think with respect to this verse, you know, being called according to our purpose, if you're called to really dig in and understand how this world operates or how the human body operates or, you know, all those things, God calls us to do that if that's your calling, you know. Do everything as unto the Lord. If that's your calling, then we dig in and we do that. And, and, and part of it for me is just, you know, kind of thinking about space and all these things every day. You know, we just got pictures back from the James Webb Space Telescope, and they were focusing on a star just to align the telescope, and yet kind of photobombing the star were a bunch of galaxies. And so you had this just 20, 30, 40, 100 galaxies in the background, each of them with hundreds of billions of stars, and there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, and then you can step back and say, God made that. God spoke that into being, you know? And so I think that this intersection of science and religion just says God has a purpose for our lives. That purpose can be better understanding our world around us, uh, and that's science, and, and the church has been involved in science for millennia and leading the way many times. And so, you know, just talking about that relationship for today, you, you get people say, oh, the religion is anti-science and all those sorts of things. I mean, no, we're called to learn, you know, and if that's your passion and your purpose, go learn, and you will honor God in doing that. And I think that's just a great opportunity for us to speak that message. Um, I'd like... Uh I'd like to ask Larry to close us in prayer, and then we'll let Pastor Matthew come back up. Okay, well, thank you, Lauren and Matthew. Let's just uh, come before the Lord. Father, as we just stand in your presence, we stand back and we are amazed in what you continue to do, the work you are doing in our lives, in this world, and we as believers, all for your purposes, Father. Help us to see those purposes. Help us to look back and understand how you have woven our lives into your purpose. And Lord, help us to take encouragement in that. Help us to take strength in that. Help us to find peace and joy in that, Father, even when we are in the difficult times. Help us to be the light and the salt that you call us to be so that your kingdom may advance throughout this community and the world. And we just put this before you in Christ's name.